The film basement is filmed in sunny West Hartford, Connecticut, in front of a live studio. Welcome to an action-packed episode of The Filmmaker's Basement. I'm Brandon. I'm Andrew. And we're going to be going over some of the movies we saw this week, in addition to a little bit of a change-up later on, um, which we'll go over at that point. Um, But the movie I saw this week was a movie I've been very excited to see because I'm a big fan of this franchise, and that is Creed 3. Still dominating the boxing world, Adonis Creed is thriving in his career and family life. When Damien, a childhood friend and former boxing prodigy, resurfaces after serving time in prison, he's eager to prove that he deserves his shot in the ring. The face-off between former friends is more than just a fight. To settle the score, Adonis must put his future on the line to battle Damien, a fighter who has nothing to lose. So, I liked Creed 3. I don't think I liked it as much as the previous movie. Um, Or even maybe the first Creed. Um, Because there's definitely some issues that it has. But overall, it does a great job of doing what these movies always do. And that's deliver an amazing fight with some good stakes. Um, And in particular, I don't know how they nail this every single time. They must have an amazing... They must have an amazing team behind this. In particular, I got to give major props to the fight choreographers, the editors, and the sound designers. Because everything to do with those people is like absolutely fantastic. All of the punches hit in a perfect way. Um, So major props to the editors there because they managed to capture perfectly just when the punches hit. The sound designer do a fantastic job of giving it like giving those punches weight. Because like, you know, in real life, punches don't sound like you're, you know, you're punching into like a what's it called? Like a, a ribeye. Like, they don't have that same sound to them, but every time a person is punched in this movie, it sounds like they're getting hit by a truck. It's incre- It's impressive. So major props to them, and major props to the fight choreographer, and even the cinematographer in this case, because they do a great job of capturing every aspect of the fight very clearly. Because a lot of times, like these action movies, the fight itself can get kind of lost. Um, you see this a lot with movies that where they really, like, they're cutting like a million times a minute. To capture like every single angle of every single scene, either because the people in the scene aren't really fighting or for a variety of other reasons. Um, But you can really tell they're, again, people are punching each other here. It really feels like that because we don't cut away too often from the action. And when we do, it's always as like the emphasis to some kind of other bit of action in the scene. So major props to that. I also love visually that, again, the fight, the way they were fighting was portrayed very clearly. And a lot of this had to do with some of the shots, too. Um, They do have some close-ups, but overall, we get a lot of really nice wide shots where we're actually watching the, you know, the actors punch each other. Because that's that's a lot of what brings people into these movies, is really good action scenes. So major props to everyone for working on those, because as always, the fights are just absolutely fantastic. They will have you on the edge of your seat. Especially with some of the stakes behind them, um, which I was a little bit mixed on, but they still do get you at the edge of the seat, think, wondering what's going to happen. Um, also, major props to the act and to all the actors, and especially to Jonathan Majors as Damien. He is the friend who is in prison for a very long period of his life. Recently, gets out and convinces um, Creed to essentially let him fight the heavyweight champion because he wants his shot at the title. I loved his portrayal of this character. It is like the perfect like mix of somebody who really like wants something, like somebody who is passionate about trying to get something. This is the only thing they want in their entire life. Who's also an amazing grifter. Um, Cause you can really see that in how he portrays the character. Cause like towards the start of the film, we see him as kind of this almost like Demir character where he's like, he's not putting himself as this, placing himself as this macho man. You get hints of it here and there where he's like this guy who will do anything to win this fight. But it's not like up front in your face until like the middle of the movie where there's a very clear switch in his character and he starts putting on that macho man. I don't need anyone. I'm the only person who got me here kind of thing. Um, It was very interesting to watch him kind of like, like work with the mannerisms he would need to portray that character as somebody who seems small, but at the same time is also very much larger than life. Um, I also really like the base story. It's like a nice return to what the original Rocky movie was, which is, you know, you're giving this random stranger a chance to get onto the major stage and fight the heavyweight champion of the world. But it has this twist in it that you're not really expecting that you can pick up on, but it doesn't, it's not apparent until you get to it in the middle of the movie, which I loved. 
It was really cool. Um, I will say, in addition to that, we also get like this interesting exploration of guilt and how that can weigh on someone, especially when it's something where you're assuming this was your own fault and there was kind of, you could have been the change that was needed to make a situation different, specifically with Creed, which worked really well in the movie. Um, I do have issues with the pacing, which I'm going to get to in a bit, and I think it really kind of affected my overall enjoyment of the story. Um, but overall, solid. I will say it never really reached the heights of the previous two movies. I think in particular, the second one is my favorite because it gives a really good, like, it's a really, like, good what if. Like, what had Dolph Lundgren, essentially, Dolph Lundgren's character, been up to in the last 35 years since he fought Rocky? And seeing how that, like, that kind of, his actions affected the people around him, in particular his son, and his own life in turn. And then watching that come into play when his son fights his son fights Creed. This movie felt a lot more isolated, which wouldn't be a bad thing if there had been more set up with Damien's character, mm. um, which kind of gets into that pacing issue I was talking about earlier. Damien, re- Damien really does show up out of nowhere, which isn't a bad thing at the start, but then I feel like it rushes way too quickly into the Rocky experience. Because again, this is a Rocky story where you're giving the underdog a chance to fight on the main stage. But that mo- but Rocky also had a lot more setup in that regard. We got to see a lot more of the behind the scenes with him and Apollo Creed kind of working each other out, seeing Rocky train for this moment. Whereas with Damien, we don't really get that. Um, we get we get some stuff in that regard, but it's mostly he goes from I want to do this to something happens with a fight where the current champion was supposed to face off against somebody else, and that person ends up not being in the picture anymore. And then Damien is thrust on the stage as a result, basically kind of playing off of the guilt Creed has for what happened to Damien and is giving him the option to fight this champion now. And it takes like, it, it, it's not like, it doesn't take like a lot of time to get there. And I really wish there had been more of a buildup into that fight. This is something we also see later on after we see Damien kind of get what he wants is that then Creed's like, cause Creed at this point is in retirement, essentially. He's like running his gym. He's training the new generation of champions because he's kind of not really in his prime anymore. But and then after Damien kind of wins this fight in a dirty way, Creed's like, all right, screw this. I'm going to challenge Damien to a fight. I'm going to win the title back for myself. Which also, again, happens very quickly. We don't really get like, we don't get to really see like, the forces that led up to this moment um, a little bit with Damien kind of like smack talking behind the scenes and like egging Creed on, but not like enough to not enough set up for me to feel confident saying it's like really solid. So definitely some issues there. Also a couple ungrounded moments, which were very strange compared to the last two movies. Cause one of the things I really like about the fights in these films is that they feel very grounded. Like I said, you feel every punch, you see everything happening. Like, They don't really tend to do like any kind of special effects with it. Mm. But we got a couple in this movie and they felt weird to me. In particular, at the beginning of the movie, we see like Creed in his last fight, essentially. And there's this moment where everything goes into slow motion and you see him punching really quickly. And then he moves to another side, like the other side of this person and punches even more. And then blah, 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 blah. And it feels off because it's not, again, it's not very grounded. It feels strange to see like that kind of thing happening. We also see this towards the end with the Creed and Damien fight where they're fighting in this ve- this huge stadium pack of people and then out of nowhere, everyone in the crowd is gone, which was actually fine for me because it kind of, it works into the story of these two characters where the fight is really just about them. It's not really about anyone in this audience. It's not about the spectacle. It's about these two people solving their issues with each other, which I didn't mind, but afterwards we get like this weird kind of like we get some additional stuff that doesn't quite fit with what I was hoping for out of this. Mm. So some, those ungrounded movies, they weren't a ton of them, but it felt weird seeing them at all in this kind of movie. That being said, overall, I did actually really like it. Again, I love Damien as a character. The fights were fantastic. The, the base story is, is very interesting. It just had some moments that like, it didn't live up to the prior two movies and it made, at least to me, made this one feel a bit weaker in comparison. Um, overall, I'd still recommend seeing it. If you're a fan of Creed, if you're a fan of these Creed movies, give it a shot. It's just, it's, it's still really good. 
Nice. Um, apparently, I like seeing just trash movies, <laughs> or or not that that I think they're trash, mm-hmm. but like critics trash these movies that I see, and I don't know why I mm-hmm. um I I do this because I I just saw Creed. Creed's tomato meter and it's actually very good like 88 88 on Rotten Tomatoes um the movie I saw um has a critic rating of um oh what was it 37 uh so I I went and saw a movie uh where the number is twice um, almost twice as as much as that I went and saw 65 Mm -hmm. So after a catastrophic crash on an unknown planet, six uh, now um, with only one chance at rescue, Mil, uh, the pilot Mills and only one other survivor, Koa, must make their way across an unknown terrain riddled with dangerous creatures in an, esca- in an epic fight to survive. Now, I left some stuff out of that storyline synopsis because it's not t- totally accurate, This that storyline. And the other storyline that I saw was um, an astronaut crash lands on a mysterious planet only to discover he's not alone, which mm-hmm. is very vague. Um, I thought this movie was going to be more like humans are traveling off Earth and they land on a planet that is inhabited with dinosaur like creatures. That's not this movie at all. What actually is this movie is that humanoid aliens um, are on a two year like starship mission to transport a bunch of people to Mm -hmm. their another planet and they crash land on Earth. But in Earth time, Mm -hmm. It's 65 million years ago. Hence the name. Makes sense. Hence the name. So technically, like humans, Earth humans, didn't exist at this time of this movie, which I thought was interesting. I thought it was going to be completely the opposite. Like like Earth humans were going to venture out and they stumble upon a planet of dinosaurs. But no, they landed on Earth dinosaurs. Um, makes sense. Which is which is cool. Um, not really sure how, you know, they get away with like a spaceship like not being found. I mean, I have a theory about it, which I'll get into in a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, but this movie I thought was good. It had that. It's it's from I think the producers of A Quiet Place, so it has that A Quiet Place feel to it, where it's just basically two characters alone assessing a threat and moving quietly throughout this jungle. And one of the characters, the little girl, doesn't speak the pilot's language, which he speaks English. But, like, she speaks more of an alien language, so they have a hard time communicating throughout the movie. And um, he... So Adam Driver is... Uh, in this movie and he gets out of his ship to assess the damage that happened. And what happened is his, his, uh, he was going through the Milky Way's asteroid belt and um, his ship gets damaged and obviously crash lands on earth and he has to assess and find a way off. And the only way to do that is to venture to the other side of this mountain range to where the back half of his ship is to get into an escape pod to leave. Um, And then he finds out that there is actually like all the passengers on this ship are all in cryostasis. And he finds out that they're all dead except for one. It's a little girl. And um, he wakes her up and they have this adventure to go to the escape pod. Um, but I, I thought this was interesting. It had a lot of like tense moments to it where like it's it's really quiet and they're like looking around the forest and they're trying to assess like where the threat is. 
and then the threat just comes out of nowhere. Um, and I also like how they depicted uh, the dinosaurs in this movie because they actually depicted what I think are uh, velociraptors in an actual like portrayal of what they are because um, Jurassic Park uh, made velociraptors like six feet tall when in reality they were only about three, four feet tall and they were like little. They were like velociraptors were very little. Uh, creatures and in this movie i was i was i was watching one scene where they had a couple of these dinosaurs and i noticed that one of them had like the the like little hook on his foot and i'm like oh that's absolutely a velociraptor but he's tiny i was like well that's how big they were originally the only problem i had with this movie and their depiction of the dinosaurs is there was like three dinosaurs oh. uh, that i had like no no there oh, was okay. like, well, there was really only like f- six types of dinosaurs mm. that we saw, and mm. five of them were meat eating dinosaurs. Uh, the, mm. Like there was no like herbivores in this in this area of the whatever they were, um, and three of the dinosaurs I had no idea what they were. Like that, like one of them was as big as a T Rex, but he had like. I don't know if you saw Jurassic World, but he it looked like an Indominus Rex because he had like really long arms like a like a Velociraptor would. <laughs> and he would walk on all fours at some at some point. There was one that looked like a Gallimimus, which is, um, um, you know, a, a plant eating like tall dinosaur. But it was a meat eating like it was really lanky and like bird like, <laughs> which I guess, you know, dinosaurs are closely related to birds. So I guess that makes sense. And then there was one that literally looked like a Pokemon. Um, it yeah. looked it looked like the lizard Pokemon. I think it's Salandit or Salazzle. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, it looked like That's a Salazzle. Weird. It was really weird. Hmm. Like it it was it was basically like a really fast Komodo dra- like fast slender Komodo dragon. That's what okay. it looked like. Um, so like that was really the only issue I had with the dinosaurs is like three of them i was like what is this dinosaur i've never seen this before but then you had like the velociraptor t-rex the pterodon um the uh compies compies were in it for a little bit and then like the one herbivore they showed uh, i was like i have no idea what that one is either uh it looked like a dinosaur that i thought it was and then i was like oh wait no that's not what that is i don't have no idea but he didn't last very long so he he died pretty quickly um but the whole plot of this movie was they had to get to the escape pod, but they were all so they were being hunted by dinosaurs, but they were also up against the clock mm-hmm. because the asteroid belt that they came through was actually the asteroid that hit the Earth that caused the uh, extinction oh, okay. of the dinosaurs. So like later on in the movie, you see this like st- like orange streak in the sky. They like they look up and they see this orange streak. And I'm like, oh, that's absolutely the extinction level event that caused the killing of all the dinosaurs. And and it was. Um, and so they were up against the clock to like escape before the asteroid hit. And it actually showed the asteroid hitting the Earth at the end of the movie. And it was actually pretty it was pretty cool special effects. Mm-hmm. um seeing seeing that um but you know it this this movie was good it it didn't have a lot of dialogue in it um mainly because the two characters didn't really speak to each other that much because of the language barrier um but just based off of the thrill aspect of it and like the like there was one part where they're in a cave and they're he's got a flashlight and he's like looking around and like he pans like the camera pans to like dark corners of the cave and you're absolutely expecting something to jump out at him um but it doesn't happen so it kind of keeps you on the edge of your seat like that so i thought it was i thought it was you're good in that aspect um the the plot was kind of like weird and like kind of like forced and just like oh crash lands gotta escape it was kind of like one of those one of those types of movies. So there wasn't really I mean, there's not much you can do with it either, because the antagonist of the movie is immediate uh, or uh, inanimate object in the meteor. And then obviously creatures that 
don't like have like emotion like that can express emotion so like the dinosaurs so that was kind of just that that is that why you think it got such a low rating or i think it it got such a i think it got such a low rating because it like um i don't know i guess i guess critics just didn't like it like Mm -hmm. audience scores is 63 it's like so Even, it's not a that's terrible, not very high it's not very, also high. not very high for audiences either usually audience no. scores like in the 80s like everyone no. usually loves stuff but huh. but it's not it's not a spilled popcorn of a movie according to imdb <laughs> um, spilled popcorn of a movie all right yeah. but interestingly enough the cast length of this movie was only four character uh, four people so like literally you saw the cast and it was just four people. It was like oh that's like the short that's like the shortest cast length I've ever seen in any movie. I mean, hey, you're paying for Keanu Reeves, you can't really afford anyone else. No, Adam Driver. Oh, Adam Driver. Yeah. I don't know why I thought it was Keanu Reeves. Adam yeah. Driver's still a pretty big name. He got a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Probably is demanding it. I thought it, I I I liked it. I didn't, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I thought it was a more accurate description of what dinosaurs would have been like uh, mm-hmm. w- against humans um, than Jurassic Park or Jurassic World was. So it's kind of a low bar, unfortunately, but it's fair. It is what it is. Um, yeah, really interesting because it seemed like this movie was getting hyped up a lot, and it just it seems like it seems like you liked it and it was fine, but it just didn't seem mm-hmm. like it delivered on that hype. But I guess not everything can. All right. Well, on that note, why don't we move not to pile of wings? I don't know if Andrew, you want to take this over this week. Um, yeah, we got so, something a little bit different. So last night we're recording this uh, the next day, but last night was the Oscars, and mm-hmm. I watched the Oscars because uh, I wanted to see. Like, there was movies that I saw, and there was people that I would like was looking that hopefully were going to win, um, and uh, Brandon hasn't seen anything about the oscars yet this year mainly because um, i forgot i forgot they exist <laughs> um so like we talked we've talked about like the golden globes and the sag awards and everything like that but this is like the echelon top tier academy awards of like mil- movies so i was going to give the nominees for each category or the big ones the big categories mm-hmm. and brandon was going to give me his theory on or, or his pick on mm-hmm. who won that category. Um, so let's start with um, best supporting actress. Actress. Oh, no. Okay, you're going to have to give me the list for this one. <laughs> the nominees are mm-hmm. Angela Bassett for Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Mm-hmm. Hong Chow for The Whale. Carrie Condon for The Banshees of Indershin. Oh. Stephanie Hsu for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. And Jamie Lee Curtis for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Oh, it's, I think Stephanie is the daughter in that movie, right? I, think I haven't seen that is. movie yet. If you, if you want to look her up real quick, I just want to make sure I'm thinking of the right person. But that's actually kind of a tough list. Hmm. Because Everything, Everywhere, All at Once is pretty unbeatable. She plays... Joy uh, Wong. Yeah, so, so yeah, she's, the, she's daughter. the daughter. I'm gonna say, okay. I'm gonna say it's probably between the two everything, everywhere all at once uh, actresses, just because that was like the movie of the year, and I which, think it would be hard to beat either of them because they were both amazing. So which which one? I'm trying to think. I'm gonna go with Joy because I, which was uh, Stephanie. I oh, think Stephanie her performance too. was a bit better than Jamie Lee Curtis. Even okay. though Jamie Lee Curtis was really good, really good in that movie. I'm going to go with Stephanie. So the Oscar goes to mm-hmm. Jamie Lee Curtis. Huh. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Fair <laughs> enough. You know what? <laughs> very, very fair. Mm-hmm. Interesting, though. Okay. Uh, so the next one will go to Best Supporting Actor. Okay. I think I already... There's one here I think I already know who it has to be. So the nominees are mm-hmm. Judd Hirsch for The Fablemans. Mm-hmm. Ki Hu Huan for Everything Everywhere All at Once. I don't even think you need to say the rest of them. It has to be Ki Hu Kwan. <laughs> that, dude, that performance was amazing. Ki Hu Kwan, Everything <laughs> Everywhere That would have been a disservice if he hadn't won that. Because he was by far one of the most important characters in that movie. Mm-hmm. 
And his performance, especially after coming back after not acting for, I can't even, like, decades. Yeah. Like, it was impressive. So that's a very well-deserved nomination right there. Uh, so best director mm-hmm. uh, is right here. Um, the nominees are Steven Spielberg for The Fablemans. Okay. Daniel Kwan for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. And Daniel Scheinert for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Martin McDowell for The Banshees of Intrigen. <sighs> Todd mm. Field for Tar. And Ruben Ostland for Triangle of Sadness. Hmm. I almost want to say the two directors of Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. The only thing that's holding me back is that Tar is on this list. And I, that feels like a very, like academy movie you know where it's like it's this is like the kind of movie that like is supposed to win these style of awards Mm. so that's what's the only thing that's holding me back right now but i'm gonna say the directors from everything everywhere all at once just because i want them to win real badly for that movie so the oscar goes to Mm. daniel kwan and daniel shinard for everything everywhere all at once that's fair (laughs) um best actress Mm-hmm. There's five. I think um, I know, but the nominees are <laughs> Anna de Armas for Blonde, mm-hmm. Kate Blanchett for Tar, mm-hmm. Michelle Williams for The Fablemans, mm-hmm. Andrea Riseborough for Two Leslie, Where and Michelle it? Yao for Everything Everywhere. All it's Michelle Yao. I there's no way it's not Michelle Yao. The Oscar goes to Michelle Yao yeah. for Everything Everywhere All at Once. <laughs> it has to be Everything Everywhere All at Once. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> Do we even need to guess best picture? Uh, best actor. <laughs> oh, best next. actor. Okay. The this nominees are. Mm-hmm. This might be a little harder. Yeah. The nominees are Colin Farrell for Banshees of Innershin, mm-hmm. Austin Butler for Elvis, mm-hmm. Brandon Frazier for The Whale, oh. Bill Nighy for Living, and mm-hmm. Paul Mescal for After Sun. Uh, See, I was going to go with Colin Farrell for a second because he was excellent in that movie. Mm -hmm. It's got to be Brendan Fraser. There's no way Brendan – because that was easily one of the most visceral movies of last year. That Mm -hmm. movie was hard to watch, and he was the entire reason that was that difficult to sit through. So Brendan Fraser for sure. The Oscar goes to Brendan Fraser for The Whale. That tracks. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I mean of the big ones – you have Best Picture. There's mm-hmm. there's quite a few of them. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. They keep going. I think they keep like choosing 10 pictures like for Best mm-hmm. Picture. So the nominees were Top Gun Maverick, Women Talking, Triangle of Sadness, mm-hmm. All Quiet on the Western Front, mm-hmm. Elvis, Tar, Avatar The Way of Water, The Fablemans, mm-hmm. The Banshees of Innershin, I keep saying that wrong. It's Inishirin. It's such a hard word to pronounce. Uh, and everything, everywhere, all at once. Hmm. Again, I want to say everything, everywhere, all at once, but I will admit Top Gun being on that list does make things a little bit harder because I know people went crazy for that movie too. But I'm going to stick with my gut and say it was definitely everything, everywhere, all at once on this one. The Oscar goes to mm-hmm. everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> They literally it went are seven else. for eleven at the Oscars. <laughs> it amazing. won seven categories. It's at the I Oscars. Mean, I think it's well earned. It's a pretty and amazing all, movie. If, if there was a if there was a best actor in that movie, I bet you it would have swept. Yeah, that that one was a. Yeah, there's no way they could have had one for the that. Only other one that won was best original screenplay. Mm -hmm. uh and best film editing Mm -hmm. Um, makes sense but other than that it once it was nominated for 11 categories it won seven of them Mm -hmm. um and i do have to say Mm -hmm. best best part about the oscars Mm -hmm. was uh those four actors and actresses winning their awards and their speeches because you you didn't expect like 10 years ago if you would have told me that those people would have won mm-hmm. an, an award 
uh, an Academy Award, mm-hmm. I would have told you there's no way. Maybe Jamie Lee Curtis. I Maybe mean, she's, Jamie but she's like, a pretty renowned actor. Her, her like walk up when they were announcing, like when they announced her mm-hmm. and her walk up, the 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 person like that was done doing the over the overhead was saying that her, she made her film debut in Halloween, and they were talking about mm-hmm. Halloween. And that's like, because that's what Jamie Lee Curtis is known huh. for. She's known for her role and her time playing huh. um, that role in ha- in Halloween. And you just it, don't, you don't, like horror movies don't get that kind of respect. Like horror actresses and actors don't get yeah. that kind of respect. Um, and so like, I wouldn't have thought that that was, that was, she was going to do it. The other thing um, was... Like they're like all four of them too were super emotional about mm. about it, and it was great. If you have a chance to go watch them, go yeah. watch them. Um, but the other thing that was the best part of the night was the person who was the um, the presenter for best picture. Mm-hmm. Do you want to venture a guess on who it was? Hmm. Is it somebody I would know? Yes. And it's somebody who is important to someone else in that cast. I have no idea who that would even be. Hmm. It was Harrison Ford. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) So when (laughs) Kihu Kwan got up on stage for best picture, Mm. it was awesome. Like he was cool. It looked, it looked like Indiana Jones and short round again, like, like reuniting. (laughs) Um, Mm-hmm. And they did that. They absolutely did that on purpose. They had to. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a thousand because, percent. Yeah, because the um, yeah, like, and Harrison Ford had like the biggest smile on his face. It was so. Mm-hmm. It was so Aww, great. It was such a cute. good moment. <laughs> it was such a good moment of like like this actor who got his he got his debut. I don't. I think it was in the Indiana Jones. Film. Probably. It was, it was either Indiana Jones films or the Goonies. It was one of the two because mm-hmm. that's like where he got his start. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you, it cuts like when, well, when Ki Hu Kwan won, they actually cut to Steven Spielberg, like mm-hmm. at one point, which was, which was very cool. Yeah. Um, and, but no, the whole night was, was good. And, mm-hmm. and it was, it was like one of those, it was like one of those Academy Awards nights where it's like everybody won that I was expecting to win except for one person. I really, really. Well, do you want me to do you, what, what category was it? For? Uh, best supporting actress. Okay. Um, uh, never mind. Then, yeah. What were you going to say? Oh, um, I really, really wanted Angela to Bassett to win best supporting actress for Black Panther Wakanda forever. Oh, fair enough. Cause like her role in that movie and her acting and performance in that movie was so stellar Mm -hmm. and it would have just put like the cherry on top of um of you know chadwick boseman passing and you know all that stuff and Mm -hmm. i thought i thought what what did you think i was gonna go with it i i don't know i just thought you it was like some category we hadn't talked about yet and i was like no you try to guess it or no it it, It was yeah yeah it's just unfortunate that it happened to come out the same year everything everywhere all at once yeah i know and and a, a lot yeah. of people thought she was robbed of, of that. Really? Yeah, a lot of people were were, were upset that that Angela mm-hmm. Bassett was robbed of huh. of that award because that's the other thing is you don't see, um, like you don't see actor or actress or best picture mm-hmm. going to a comic book movie. Yeah, it, it's happened once. It was two thousand eight, and it was mainly because. Heath Ledger passed away. That's Mm -hmm. pretty much why they gave him the award. It was Mm -hmm. posthumously. Um, So, you know, um, it was well-deserved, you know, in 2008 when, Mm -hmm. when he played the Joker as best supporting, supporting actor. Um, But this, this would have been well-deserved too um, as well. So, but other than that, it was good night. You know, um, uh, there was a few movies on there that I haven't seen and and, and that uh, uh, that I had never heard of, mainly mm-hmm. in the like short film categories, yeah. um, and the uh, best documentary. Sense. I I don't really I've never seen, but like, um, what was best documentary? Which one? Which the film Elephant Whispers? Never even heard of that either. <laughs> the Elephant Whispers. <laughs> um but other than that like um all quiet on the western front won a couple of categories uh i think top 
Gun won best sound, you know, everything everywhere all at once obviously swept. The whale yeah. got a cup the whale got two. They also got best makeup and hairstyling. That's very valid. Because mm-hmm. that the the makeup that what was it called? The the effects makeup the that Fred Fraser had yeah. was very impressive. Uh Avatar won best visual effects, which is mm. not surprising. Yeah. It's probably gonna Oops. win best visual effects. The next one that comes out next year. Who and is? then mm-hmm. Uh, oh, best animated feature went to Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Yeah, fair enough. That was a pretty, pretty solid movie. Pretty, very yeah. creative movie. So, night major so. props to them for that. But other than that, you know, I, I have to see everything everywhere all, all once. Obviously, it's just really good, man. Um, it's, it's just on, a really good movie. It's on Showtime, so mm-hmm. like I can't watch it until it goes on something else, or I'll have to rent it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think so, yeah. it's worth it personally. But that's just me. Mm-hmm. That oh was God. the 95th Academy Awards from last night. Yeah, congratulations also, to everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah, Jimmy Kimmel was pretty funny too. Oh, fair enough. So good for him. All right. Well, on, on that note, why don't we why don't we try to close out for today? Um, yeah, Andrew, do you have anything you want to plug before we go? Um, yeah, actually, I do. Uh, really quick, when we've mm-hmm. got like a minute. Um, if you are in the San Diego area. Mm-hmm. Or if you are in the, I don't know where it is, but like Massachusetts, if you're in Massachusetts, Boston or, or Connecticut mm-hmm. or something, um, police three has actually been accepted to be shown at two film festivals. Now one is the Massachusetts independent film festival. I'm not sure where it is. I've tried to look it up m- many times, but I still get nothing. And then that is on April, it's like 12th to 15th, I think. And then on May 19th, I think it is, or 15th, one of the two dates, we'll get we'll get verification mm-hmm. on it. That, it's going to be shown at the San Diego GI Film Festival. So if you want to go see Police 3 and um, our good friend Jimmy Lucar's uh, first um, short film, official mm-hmm. short film, um, go do that. Just as a quick note, it looks like the Massachusetts Independent Film Festival um, is taking place at the Hilton Garden Inn in Worcester, Massachusetts. Worcester. Worcester. However you say it, I don't know. Okay, so Worcester. From April 12th to 15th. If you're near Worcester or you're near San Diego, check it out. Check it out. Yes, I don't have anything I'd like to plug this week, so I think on that note we'll close it out. Thank you all for watching The Filmmaker's Basement. I'm Brandon. I'm Andrew. And we will see you all next time. Bye.